Okay, well, I think we might as well get started. Well, good morning to everybody and a very warm welcome to you this morning. My name is Jenny Wilcock, and along with our fabulous team, we run Sullivan Dewing Chartered Accountants and Business Builders based in Caringbar. Today, we are hosting for you a share market update with Andrew Tyrrell, Senior Investment Advisor, and Martin Crabb, Chief Investment Officer from Shore and Partners. Andrew and Martin will guide you through the latest developments and trends shaping the share market landscape. They will provide us with a comprehensive insight and an overview of the Australian share market so that we know where to invest, what stocks will bring some capital growth, and where we can look for some dividend return. Sounding good, pretty good so far, isn't it? Before we start, just some housekeeping. Um, if I can just get you to, uh, guys to flick across the next slide for me. Before we start, some housekeeping. So if you have any questions, um, if you don't mind typing them in to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, um, there's also a chat box down there as well. So we'll make sure we get them from either one of those locations. Uh, and we will ask these questions of Andrew and Martin at the end of our presentation. Well, um, I've also got a, some extra bonus questions that we'll ask as well, and we'll make sure at the end of today's session that we will email you the presentation slides and this webinar recording. So I would now like to introduce Andrew Tyrrell and Martin Crabb. Andrew is a third generation senior investment advisor with 25 plus years experience in finance. He moved from retail broking about nine years ago to partner with his father, John, before his retirement. Martin is Chief Investment Officer, joining Shaw and Partners in 2011 with 30 years experience across financial markets and roles spanning international stockbroking, wealth management, research and portfolio management. Shaw and Partners is one of Australians, Australia's preeminent investment advice and wealth management firms. With a national presence of $30 billion of assets under advice, Shaw and Partners offers the intimacy of a boutique investment firm backed by the resources and scale of a major global financial group, EFG International, managing over $260 billion in assets. We are very fortunate to have Andrew and Martin here with us today. Over to you, Andrew and Martin. Fantastic. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, hopefully, yeah, everyone on board will uh, take a fair bit out of this this morning. But I'll, I'll pass to Martin, who will run through a, a presentation, which will give you very much a macro view of the market, what he's thinking, what the firm's thinking, some global ideas, especially a lot of talk about interest rates and inflation at the moment, um, possibly some forecast where the market's looking on that. And then at the end, we can, yeah, certainly happy to take some questions and then we can run through some of the preferred sector picks in the big end of town, if you like, as well. Great, thanks, Andrew. Um, Martin Crabb here, so thanks for joining us this morning. Um, uh, what I'm gonna do is focus on the, on the big picture. Uh, so we run, we run about um, $2 billion of separately managed accounts here at Shaw and Partners, and I look after that. So it's my job to invest other people's money, uh, which, is, which is an interesting role, as you can imagine, and, and pretty stressful at times, hence the amount of gray hair that I have, but you want someone with gray hair looking after your money. Um, so I'm going to talk sort of very big picture and then maybe between Andrew and I, we can talk about the sectors and stocks in the Aussie market, which are, which are interesting and play to this. So general advice disclaimer. So if this um, does get sent to any clients, this is, this is just general advice, not specific or personal advice. And that means you can't sue either of us if anything doesn't turn out the way you would like it to do. And you may actually lose money if you follow in some of the recommendations. So you, you guys probably know about general advice disclaimers, but that, that's that. So I'm going to talk about asset allocation. What is it? Why is it important? Um, generally speaking, when you invest money, you're either in shares or bonds or things that look like shares or things that look like bonds. So in, in, included in that is real estate, which kind of looks like a bond, cash, which looks like a bond, and then anything to do with the business, whether it's a, a small or medium enterprise or a listed business or whatever, is, is equity. So this is the performance of equities divided by the performance of bonds globally, uh, since these indices were produced in, in 1969. Upwardly sloping, which suggests that uh, shares do better than bonds over time. They should do, they're risky. But you can see there's long periods of time when bonds actually outperform equities. 
Uh, and there's probably a 20 or 30 year span there where it didn't really matter whether you're in bonds or equities, you did about the same. So recently, obviously, equities have performed a lot better than bonds. And, you know, is that going to continue into the future? So asset allocation is really about saying, which of these sectors do I want to be in? Do I want to be defensive or aggressive? Sorry. So that black line, I've just overlaid the US yield curve, which is basically monetary policy. So are short-term interest rates lower than long-term interest rates? If that's the case, then that line is very low. So, and when short-term interest rates are higher than long-term interest rates, um, that that yield that um, yield curve goes in the opposite direction. Now, it is it is inverted on the on the right-hand scale. So, at the moment, we have an inverted uh, yield curve where short-term interest rates are higher than long-term interest rates. When that tends to happen, um, equities stop outperforming bonds and start underperforming bonds. So, when that when that peaks, when that red line peaks, that's generally the end of the bull market in equities and it starts a bull market in bonds. So that's what kind of history is telling us at the moment um, to, to be a little bit cautious. Um, monetary policy is predictable. So when I talk about that red line in the previous chart, that's the difference between the, the rate that the Reserve Bank or the, the US Federal Reserve set and what the market sets for long-term interest rates. Um, and that really is a product of inflation and unemployment. So every central bank has the same mandate. Um, it's called a dual mandate. And central banks, and whether it's the Bank of Japan, the uh, European Central Bank, they're all the same. They have to get inflation down to their target, but they want to try and maintain maximum employment. So give everyone a job, but make sure you don't overheat the economy and cause inflation. Now, when the, when the unemployment rate and the inflation rate are in the Reserve Bank's target, the share market does very well. Almost half of all the returns in the share market since World War II have happened when conditions are where the Reserve Bank wants them to. So they don't have to tighten or loosen interest rates. So at the moment, we've got rates that are a little bit too high, but we, we can predict what central banks do just by looking at inflation and unemployment. So that's great. How easy is it to predict changes in these asset allocations? Uh, it's very difficult. There's lots of very, very well-educated, smart people out there trying to do it. Um, we look at four key measures to determine whether our clients are defensive and cautious or whether they can take on a little bit more uh, growth in their portfolio. So I'm just going to go through the quickly growth financial conditions, the Fed reaction function and valuation. So why is growth important? Um, you need to look at forward leading indicators of growth. There's no point looking at what the economy is doing today. The market's already discounted that probably 18 months ago. So we need to find an indicator that predicts growth going forward. Fortunately, there are, there are a few out there, and one is done by the OECD, um, and they go back to the 1950s. And when their composite leading indicator, which they produce for every country, country on a monthly basis, when that's rising, uh, you do very, very well out of the share market. When it's falling, you do very, very poorly. So it's when the outlook for growth is improving or the outlook for growth is getting worse rather than the actual level. And you can see the difference between the two is quite dramatic. We then look at financial conditions. So that's basically roughly how easy is it to get money and how expensive is it to get money? Um, there's a whole bunch of measures that go into this index, which again is produced by a, a central bank in America and, and goes back to the 1970s. When financial conditions are loosening, i.e. it's easier to get a loan, uh, you do very well out of the share market. When it's getting harder to get a loan, it gets it gets pretty ugly. You actually lose money investing when it gets harder. So if you think about Australia in the last two or three years, three years ago, you could walk into any bank, anyone with a pulse could get a loan. You could lock it in for three or four years and you can probably get a rate below 2%. The same person walking into a bank now will have much tighter conditions. They'll have to show income and assets. Uh, they won't be able to uh, borrow the whole lot and it'll cost them 6%, and they won't be able to fix it for four years. So it's much harder to get money now than it was. That's financial conditions tightening. And when that happens, uh, markets don't tend to do well. Um, and finally, uh, what, are, what are central banks doing? So when, this, when inflation is high and unemployment is low, like it is now, central banks typically have to uh, raise interest rates. And when that condition is looking like it's happening, markets don't do well. On the flip side, in a recession, 
um, when they've got a cut rates, you do well. So if you buy shares in a recession, you tend to do better than if you buy them at, at the end of a bull market. Finally, just looking at valuation. So you're in, you're in the accounting profession, you understand business valuation, and a very common measure is the price to earnings ratio, which is today's price divided by a forecast of earnings over the next 12 months. So we aggregate that for all the forecasts in the market. And it's about 15.6 times at the moment. Market's come off since I did this slide by a few percent. So it's probably trending back down towards maybe 15 times. That's a little bit expensive. So shares are a little bit more expensive than history. Uh, the average is about 14 and a half. If we look in the US market, which has been a fantastic performer, shares have got quite expensive in America. The average uh, PE ratio in America is about 19. You can see the average is higher as well. US companies don't tend to pay large dividends, so they reinvest all the money and they grow faster. So that's why the PEs in the US are higher. Where it gets interesting is the world X US. So if we take the US market out of the world, we're looking at about 13 times, which is A, below Australia, but B, also below the average. So companies in Europe and Asia look very attractive on a valuation basis, but uh, a bit of a mixed picture on that. So, so where are we? Um, Really, as Andrew said, the, the focus for most investors is inflation and interest rates. So if we if we think that inflation is coming down, then interest rates have probably peaked and maybe we can start seeing interest rates lot getting lower going forward. So we really need to understand where we are in the cycle. So I'll just skip over a few slides here and just talk about, I suppose, where, where Australian interest rates are versus measures of inflation. So Probably the, 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 better, the best uh, measure of implied inflation, so what investors really think inflation is going to do in the long term is, is, is this measure here. So you can buy inflation-protected securities, uh, CPI-linked bonds, which pay you uh, a, a, a distribution yield in excess of inflation. So if you want to protect your, your liability uh, against inflation, you can buy um, an inflation-protected security, and that implies inflation about 2.8% for the next decade. And I've just shown that on the red line there on the chart is, in, is that measure over time since those bonds started in the mid-90s. And you can see that most of the time, the market thinks that the Reserve Bank's going to get rates, uh, inflation where they like, which is 2 to 3%. So occasionally it goes out of that band, but right now we're right almost smack bang in the middle. So if you think inflation is going to be uh, 3% or 28 in the long term, where are interest rates going to go? And if I just take one minus the other, you know, my, my theory is there's three phases of monetary policy in Australia. We had high real interest rates, so that's the cash rate minus the inflation rate of about 3% for a long period of time. And that's, at that time, Australia had a large current account deficit. So we were importing a lot more than we were exporting. And if you do that, you've got to go and borrow the difference from the global markets. And that means you need to attract uh, savings with high interest rates. So we had high real interest rates until the GFC. Now, what happened during the GFC, apart from a global recession, was that China became a massive customer of Australia, big buyer of iron ore and, and coal and other raw materials to fuel their industrialization. So that pushed us into a current account surplus, which we've enjoyed since then. So Australia's current account surplus is about 2 or 3% of GDP right now. We export a lot of gas, a lot of coal, a lot of iron ore. And while that structural um, current account uh, surplus is in place, we can have zero real interest rates, which we've enjoyed for most of the last decade. So my, my feeling is that we go back to zero real rates, in which case the cash rate is 2 to 3% going forward. The question is, how do we get there? So as I said, the, the, the Reserve Bank um, reaction function, it's the same as the, the Federal Reserve, when unemployment is, high, is low and inflation is high, they have to cut rates. Uh, so where are we at the moment? This is, the US, this is our Australian data. Um, we've got 4.9% inflation as of last month. There's another inflation number coming out tomorrow for August, which may show a little bit of a pickup to over five, but inflation is still too high and the Reserve Bank said that. So we've got very low unemployment. Most of your customers will struggle to find workers even with 350,000 immigrants, it's really hard to get workers. We have a very tight labour market, both here and in America. In America, there's almost 10 million job vacancies and less than 6 million unemployed people, for example. So unemployment is very low. That's great for the economy and for, for, for society as a whole, but inflation is still too high. So we need to probably keep rates high for longer or continue to raise them. 
Um, I'll just skip over. Look, rents are a big part of the CPI. According to SQM, they're still growing at about 16% on an annualised basis. And, and most people who rent a house have probably had an upgrade to their rent. Um, probably most importantly for the Reserve Bank, however, is not what inflation is doing now. It does seem to be coming down, uh, but from a very high level. It's about inflation expectations, and this is really important to understand. So if everyone thinks inflation is going to be 5%, then you ask for a 6% pay rise, right? You want, you want a real wage rise from your boss. So if your boss gives you a 6% pay rise, she has to go out and put her prices up by 7% to pay for it, right? So um, if that if everyone puts up their prices by 6 or 7%, then you've got a 7% pay rise and you're off to the races. And that's exactly what happened in the 1980s. So I'm old enough to remember, even though I was in short shorts, old enough to remember 10% inflation and 10% wage uh, growth when we had centralised wage fixation and, and people would go on strike if they didn't get their 10%. So we don't want to go back to that. That's very corrosive. If you're on a fixed income, having 5 or 10% inflation is, is terrible. And a lot of people are suffering right now because the cost of living uh, pressures. So the really good news is that inflationary expectations are coming down. You've seen the, the investment market view on inflation. This is a whole bunch of different measures. And you can see the right-hand side of that chart, inflation expectations are coming down more into the target band of the Reserve Bank, which is 2 to 3%. If that continues to persist, that's good news. If we do see a spike because of petrol prices, so anyone's filled up their car lately will know petrol prices have gone nuts again. If things like that start to happen, then the Reserve Bank's going to have to tighten rates even further. But we really watch these very closely. So where, where are the, what's the market saying on interest rates at the moment? It has changed a lot in the past week. So I've almost got to update this slide every day because it changes so much. But this is as of last night. Um, Cash rates are expected to peak at about four point. Well, the, the next rate hike would be would be 25 basis points, and that would take the cash rate to 4.35. You can see that the market's almost there. So it's pricing in almost 100% chance of another rate hike. And this is on the back of the, uh, the rhetoric from the central bankers in the US that they're going to leave rates high for longer. So that's the other thing that you can read from that chart is that if rates do go up another 25 bips, they're probably going to stay there for all of next year. So those of us that are looking for a bit of relief on our mortgages, probably not going to happen at the moment. So at, at, you would need a, a pretty um, deep recession to, for, that, for that view to change and for rates to come down quicker. So that's the outlook for Aussie rates. For US rates, it's a very similar story. So they're currently 5.25 to 5.5. Um, and the market's saying there's probably another rate hike to come. Their next meeting's in November. But then they stay pretty sticky. You can see that even by the end of next year, we've got 4.75. So that's maybe one or two rate cuts, not a whole bunch out there. So higher for longer. So just moving forward. Oops, sorry. Um, in terms of some of the measures that I talked about. So what are these growth indicators telling us at the moment? Uh, the Chinese economy started showing signs of life in the middle of last year when Xi Jinping stopped wearing a mask in public. In October, it was pretty obvious they were going to abandon their zero COVID policy and that economy's um, looked like improving. The US, which is the, the uh, green line, um, started showing signs of life back in February and March, particularly once the, the central bank bailed out uh, Silicon Valley Bank and, uh, and the Swiss National Bank bailed out Credit Suisse, both of which were going broke. Um, that, that was a significant step in terms of financial conditions and growth and markets have recovered since then. And the global economy showed, started showing signs of life in October. Like growth is still slowing. Most of these measures are still below 100, but it's slowing at a slower pace. So what the market is, is worried about is not the level of growth, it's the rate of change. It's the second derivative. The bad news is the Australian outlook is still deteriorating. So the economy is likely to be worse in nine months than it is today. So just thinking about portfolios, it looks like global equities are cheaper, especially outside America and the growth outlook is improving in those global economies faster than it's improving in Australia. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, things in Australia, the Westpac Melbourne Institute leading index, um, it's, it's not, it's below, again, it's below zero. So suggest the economy is still slowing, but maybe signs of life um, starting to come in there, but, but pretty noisy still. The other thing I mentioned was um, financial conditions. They are improving. 
Uh, not all measures are improving, but if you're a, a corporate seeking to borrow money in the US, it's getting cheaper over there. Um, and, and measures of risk like volatility indices are, are way down. So it suggests that financial risk is very low. And so the cost of gaining equity finance is, is low. And also, um, you know, credit conditions are improving. The, the concern I have, however, is the red line, which is US 30-year fixed rate mortgage uh, interest rate. So unlike Australians, American bo Americans borrow money to buy a house with a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, and that rate's 7.5%. So I don't know how many people on the call would be happy to borrow money to buy a house for 30 years and pay 7.5%. That would wreck a lot of households, right? So a lot of people can't afford that. And therefore, the housing market is, is pretty bad. And that's a big part of the US economy. So until that rate starts to come down, I'm, I'm just a little bit cautious on that financial conditions. We really want to see fixed rate mortgages come back down. Maybe not to the 3% they were uh, post-COVID, but maybe maybe something like five would be, would be a better number. Um, the other thing that's happening in America is that deposits are draining out of the banking system at an unprecedented rate. About $1 trillion has been taken out of bank accounts in the last 12 months, that's never happened before. This chart goes all the way back to the 1970s and we've never had 5% of deposits leave the banking system. The reason is that US banks really don't pay interest on checking accounts and savings accounts. You've got to go to a money market fund to do that. That's what's been happening. Uh, of the 17 and a half trillion in cash deposits, about a trillion has gone into money market funds. If you're a bank and your deposits are being drained, you need to reduce your loans. So that's the black line, that's credit. So US bank credit is actually negative at the moment and that'll continue to happen while deposits move out. So just even though the financial conditions index does look like it's improving, there's a few warning signs that, that, I'm, that I'm watching that just keep me a little bit cautious. And then finally, as I said, the Fed's not done yet. This is the last dot plot that came out last week. This is the federal governors that vote on interest rates. It's their view of what the appropriate level of interest rates is. And 12 out of the 19 think one more hike is likely. Seven out of the 19 have said we're at the right level. As you can see, if we go into 24, 25, 26, rates will be lower and the longer term should be two and a half, but at the moment, uh, a little bit further to go. Um, so there is an increased chance of a soft landing. So the narrow golden path, as, as some bankers call it. So what's supposed to happen uh, is that in order to get inflation out of the system, you need to kill the economy. You need to put a lot of people out of work. You need to get businesses to go broke. And so you, you kill demand in the economy and that gets the inflation out of the system. In the 1970s and 80s, that's exactly what happened. Interest rates were put up to almost 20% and killed the economy. We had 10% unemployment, but we got rid of inflation and we got rid of inflation for 50 years and it's only just come back. So the, the school of thought and, and the the Taylor rule and the Phillips curve and all these things you learn at uni uh, suggest that we need to get unemployment up. So what's happening at the moment is inflation's coming down without unemployment going up. That's a really, really good outcome for the market. It's a really good outcome for society. If we can avoid putting people out of work and get inflation down, we can cut interest rates and everybody's happy. So that's why the market's rallying so much this year is that this is increasingly likely. It's never happened before. So it's not something that you, you would predict would happen. Most people think a, a, a hard landing is what's going to happen, but the fact that it's a soft landing is really positive. So in terms of how we manage portfolios, you know, we, we look after uh, multiple asset classes. So a lot of our investors just have Australian shares, but increasingly people want diversified portfolios and there's good reasons for that, which I'll talk about in a second. So at, at the, uh, you know, in August uh, this year, we had about 10% cash in our portfolio more than we would typically have. So we would typically own 3% cash in our portfolios. We had 13 and we had less in all the growth assets. So we had less in Australian shares, small caps and, and global equities. Because of this increased chance of a soft landing and it looks like the central banks are done or close to being done, it looks like growth starting to improve or the outlook for growth is improving and uh, financial conditions starting to loosen uh, it suggests we should be at least neutral. So we've moved back to a more neutral stance. We were underweight cash. We've got a few bonds in there because US 10-year bonds are now yielding 4.5%, which is a pretty attractive yield. And you can get better than that with corporate debt. So 
you are starting to get some pretty juicy interest rates in very, very low risk investments, which suggests that you do that with your cash. So we've moved back to a neutral, a neutral setting within that. So this is what a balanced portfolio looks like at Shore and Partners. This is designed to give your investors or yourself, uh, you know, uh, cash plus 4%. So the RBA cash rate plus 4% over the economic cycle. So five to seven years. And since we launched these portfolios back in uh, 2015, they've, they've achieved that sort of return. So as you can see, it's got a good mix of investments, not all the eggs in one basket. But I just wanted to touch on one theme, which is just going global. So uh, if you leave Australians alone and give them no advice, this is what they tend to do with their money. So self-managed super funds is probably the largest pool of self-directed investments. It's about a trillion dollars. And this is from the ATO statistics, which are published each, each uh, month. 97% of self-managed super funds are invested in domestic investments. Only 2.5% are invested overseas. And basically, psychologically, most uh, investors have a home country bias. They invest in what they know, and they think that stuff overseas is risky. When they think overseas, they think China invading Taiwan, Russia invading Ukraine, it's all too risky. You know, Trump becoming president, it's all too risky. I'll just stick with Woolies and Telstra and BHP and Combank because I know them, or I'll buy an investment property or a term deposit. So there's a real problem about being so domestically focused, and it's because of the composition of investment markets. So our market is full of banks. So banks and other financials make up 30% of our, of our market. And we do have world-class banks. Like they, their return on equity, their, uh, their loss ratios, they're world-class. We have really good mining companies. So BHP, Fortescue, Rio, South 32, they're world-class uh, companies. They make up 25% of our market. And then we've got a couple of REITs, you know, Goodman and a few others. And, and that's about it. So if you look at the three far largest, fastest growing, arguably most dynamic industries in the world, uh, they're just not available in any, in any sort of form in Australia. Healthcare, consumer discretionary and information technology, that's where all the fun's happening right now. Uh, developments in healthcare with with um, biologic drugs like GLP-1s and the Moderna vaccine. Uh, that's that's uh, world changing. Information technology, reading about artificial intelligence and the cloud and software as a service. You've really, really got to go overseas to get those stocks. So that's all very well. That's all very academic, but there's a financial reason you do it as well. So there is, there is a free lunch out there and it's called diversification. And so if you take all of your money and put it in Aussie equities, including the franking credits, because most people don't put them in their studies, but we do because our clients enjoy franking credits, as yours would do. Um, you know, since the franking credit index was introduced in 2005, shares have done 9%, including franking credits, on a compound basis, which is a fantastic number. So that's the top right there, 100% ASX. Global equities have only done 8.4. So you're saying, Martin, why would I take some of my Aussie shares and put them overseas if I get a lower return? And it's all about risk reduction. So if you can reduce the volatility of your return, so if it goes down by 50, it's got to go up 100, for example, you get higher returns over time. So there is, so that's not supposed to happen, right? If you take high risk, you're supposed to get higher return, right? So, but the fact is you can, by blending Aussie equities and global equities, you can get a better outcome. So we're really uh, suggesting, we, we don't want people to run out and sell all the shares tomorrow, but for new investors, making sure our clients are balanced in terms of their uh, portfolio and having, you know, 50 or 40% of their equities in global markets. And it makes a lot of sense right now because growth's improving globally and valuations are cheaper globally, particularly outside the US. So that's kind of, that's kind of the message that we're on at the moment. So with that, I might, um, I might uh, pause, um, maybe throw it across to Andrew to talk more specifically about the Aussie market or maybe even take some questions. Andrew. Yeah, Gina, how are we set for time on your end? I think you might be on mute. You're on mute, Jen. There we go. Thank you. Yep, you're up. Uh, you know, we're going well for time. We've um we've got some uh, we've got some questions coming through. Um, and happy um happy to hear from you too, Andrew. If you want yep. to um, to add to Martin's um slide. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so Martin's very much the big macro scene, the big global scene. Um. And then uses all that information to look at his portfolios. We use the same information. We meet with Martin, or we have a morning meeting here, pretty much every morning, where Martin will go over this. Not every week, but every now and then, and give us a full rundown of what he's seeing overseas. And we use that information to build our portfolios here, and again with your clients as well. 
obviously for self-managed super fund, as Martin was alluding to, franking credits are very important. So we also have a pretty big focus in those accounts um, to look at the franking credits and look at the quality of the names. And with everything that Martin said, yes, you can take two views of it. You can take the bearish view saying, okay, everything's still getting worse. Or you take the positive view, as Martin said, you've got to look six to nine months out for equities because that's where they're pricing it. Like if you're looking right now in the markets and, you know, over this last year, you'd be very hesitant. And we're seeing that with volumes today in the market. The market volumes are very light and we're seeing a lot of whipsawing. So if you, when you get a chance, or I can send a chart through um, to you later today, if you look at what the market's done for the last 12 to 16 months, we've been up and down, up and down. We've had some big moves, 200 points higher, 400 points lower, et cetera. But net, net, the market's actually not really gone anywhere from a capital growth point of view. Within that, obviously, certain sectors have outperformed others. And then within that as well, if your capital growth has gone nowhere, but you're getting that franking and your franking credits, you can still get a very good return of, you know, 6 7% for the year, which is still not a bad outcome um, for the markets. Taking all that information into account, like if we're looking at portfolios and we're looking within port, um, certain sectors, for example, the banks, the financial sector is always one where the press would love to you know, destroy a bank. Hopefully they don't because we'll have a lot more problems out there than just inflation. But it's something where if you look within the banking sector, you've got the four major banks, you've got ANZ, CBA, Westpac and NAB. We've also got the Macquarie Bank, which is a smaller, but you wouldn't say that's one of the majors. But within that CBA bank, Everyone loves the share price has done very, very well. It's sitting, let's say, circa $100 a share at the moment. It's trading around 2.4 times book value. And then if we can compare that to ANZ and Westpac, they're both trading at one times book value. ANZ and Westpac are yielding 6%, a little bit more, fully franked. So you gross that up, let's say, around 8.5%. CBA is yielding closer to 4 On a risk metric, you just go, well, purely on valuation grounds, you'd buy Westpac and ANZ because CBA, in my view, is not two and a half times better than Westpac. So you look at it on that, and that's how we then structure a portfolio for the clients. We'll look at what they're holding. We'll look at where they're underweight. But it, it, my view in the market at the moment is ANZ and Westpac, if you're looking for the long term, they're certainly the two banks you'd be buying at the moment. Um, if you want some international exposure, which Martin was alluding to that earlier through his presentation as well, with international exposure, you can look at something like a Macquarie Bank, you don't get the, it's not fully franked, but two thirds of their earning come from offshore. So a third out of America, um, a third out of Europe um, and a different st structure of bank to a degree. It's very much a managed fund, uh, does a lot of managed investments in the infrastructure, still does the mum and dad retail in Australia, but of a very small percentage. So you wouldn't really compare that to an ANZ bank. It's more of an investment bank structure. Looking at the big miners, flipping to another sector like Martin mentioned BHP, Rio, Fortescue, all fantastic companies. BHP is probably, if you're looking at that sector, it would be my go-to purely because it is a bulk, um, bulk miner, but very diversified. It's looking for growth. It's just come through a very much an income cycle. So over the last two to three years, you would have seen BHP paying out close to 20% in income, which has been fantastic. Every client sat there and said, oh my God, look at all this money I've made from BHP, which is wonderful. But as uh, one of our esteemed colleagues here used to say that you never buy a mining company for its yield because dividends do change. And miners, they will go through that cycle where you have the commodity price like iron ore that was sitting around $200 a ton and BHP was making circa 300 million tons a year. It makes a lot of money. So that cash flow was coming back to shareholders. They've now changed that cycle. They're looking now more for growth. So the income has dropped. It's, it's close to five, five and a half, six percent a year. It's still fully franked, but it's just one you keep in mind that, okay, the company's now spending a lot of that money and focusing on growth, which in my view is, what, is where you want to be in this market. You want companies that have positive cash flow. You want companies that are looking to actually continue to grow. Um, you don't want companies that are holding back all the cash to pay down debt and not actually grow and trying to stay where they're treading water, so to speak. So I like companies that are looking for growth. BHP is one of them. Fortescue is an interesting one. You would have seen a lot of press with Fortescue at the moment. Um, it's something I've always looked at management of companies when I'm looking at advising on the company. At the moment, Andrew Forrest, you can either love him or hate him. Everyone in the market will have a view on him. Um, but it's just the concern I have for that company. It's a one-trick pony, being iron ore. The forecast for iron ore is reasonably bearish. They're all talking about $80 a ton uh, if you're looking forward for about 12 months on iron ore. But I take that with a grain of salt because commodity forecasters very rarely get it right. 
Um, iron ore is currently sitting around $120 a tonne. If it stays in, in between 80 to 120, the miners are still making a lot of money, but obviously it's less than they're making today. But the concern with Fortescue is they've had three or four CEOs in the last three years. They've just lost the CFO. They've had a lot of exco committee members leave the company. So something's not right at the top at Fortescue. So I prefer to take the risk out of Fortescue and look at something like a BHP or even to a Rio to a lesser degree, just because you, you're not having that turmoil at the top because something's not right going on at the top of that business at the moment. Um, and then if you keep moving through the different sectors, obviously, as Martin alluded to, the international tech is a big place where Australia, we have zero tech. Um, America, if you look at the S&P 500, that's probably circa 30% of their index is made up of the big tech companies. Um, you, you've got the FANG, which is your Facebook, your Apples, your Netflix, your Googles. We have, there are opportunities in Australia, instead of having to go out and buy Apple in America and then set up an international account and you know buy one of those companies. There are platforms in Australia, one called an ETF, which is an exchange traded fund. We have one which I've used very successfully for a number of clients, which we buy via, um, it's called the NAS, it's NDQ is the stock code. It's basically the NASDAQ 100. So you're buying the 100 biggest tech companies in the world, which is listed on the NASDAQ. And it's just an easy add-on to a portfolio where you can reduce that burden or that exposure to Australia. You get access to these big companies like you've got NVIDIA, which has gone, I think, almost tenfold this year. Um, that's one of the big AI companies in America. You also get the benefit of the Apples and the Microsofts and everything else in there. You've got the Facebook. It's And the best thing about it, it's, it's run purely by computers. I think it costs six or eight basis points to sit into the NASDAQ 100, but it gives you that exposure. And that's you're not looking for income on that. That's purely about capital return. And that's a space where I think technology, as we've seen, and just in our lifetime, how much that has evolved from, I remember the first job, I didn't even have a computer on my desk. Um, and then I think we had a phone probably 10 years after that. Like then the mobile phones went from the, the doctors carrying the brick and the, the shoulder strap to now most people carry two mobile phones. I don't really understand why they carry two, but they do. Um, but that's something where technology is really evolving. Um, ChatGPT, I'm not sure how many of the clients have heard of it, but that is something that it is amazing. Um, we use it quite regularly here. Um, and that, again, it's still free to use, but that's something which is evolving. And that's a space where the NASDAQ 100, you get access to that, and that gives you that global diversification. Healthcare, another one which Martin alluded to. Yes, globally, very, very large healthcare companies. We have some fantastic healthcare companies here in Australia as well. CSL, one of them at the moment, that's the company. Again, I like super funds. You don't put a lot in the CSL because you're not getting a lot of income. However, you've got to look at the capital growth perspectives on CSL as well. That stock's trading circa $250. The market, I think it's very heavily researched. The average price in the market for CSL is about 330. So there's a lot of capital gain potential, potential there. And then as Martin alluded to on that, um, the drug, the GL drug, which is... Um, with ResMed at the moment, we've seen the ResMed share price drop from about $34 down to circa 21. ResMed is all that sleep apnea. You see the machines, it's a fantastic Australian company, very much in the global place. And again, because of this new weight loss drug that's come along, um, a lot, the, the concern in the market is that the sleep apnea won't be as prevalent around the world, which I think is probably a little bit far-fetched. And the fact that it's almost sold off you know, 40%, I think that's something we can certainly look at Again, a US earner uh, gives you that global perspective, similar to CSL. Not a lot of income, but just in regards to a capital growth, that's something we can certainly look at when we build portfolios as well. But I think that's probably, in a nutshell, that's the way we look at it. We've obviously got the big supermarkets in Australia, Coles and Woolworths. Is, at the moment, though, one will outperform the other for a period of a couple of years and then they switch. But as I think I've said to you, Jen, and probably with your father many times, is that people have always got to eat. Um, and it, it proved during COVID. Uh, we saw that through COVID where the market was very, very tough. You saw a very rapid decrease in the equity market and global markets. And we saw the, the supermarkets do well. Because why? Because at the end of the day, you couldn't go out. The only place you go for food was the supermarkets. Yes, not a very sexy company. It's never going to really outperform in a good market but it's just going to always trug along um, and you get an all right income on the side, but very, very safe holding in something like that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's some really good tips in there, Andrew, and um, and certainly some very good information from Martin as well. Where, Andrew, where do you think that the share market will be at by Christmas and where do you think it will be at by June next year? Yeah, it's good questions. If you go back to um, in the last quarterly I wrote, which a lot of your clients would have received, 30 June, as in just gone, we, the market went up about 9.6% for that financial year. Um, since 30 June to now, I think we're slightly up. I think, mate, it's very, very line ball. Like if you look at the markets, I'll get the exact numbers. I don't have them on me, but looking at Christmas. So at the moment, we're circa 7,200, I think the index is. I think toward the end of September, if we look at September in a month of itself, it is historically one of the worst months of the year. If you go back through history, May and September, um, and September is typically very weak. This the back end of this week, we've got a lot of dividends being paid out. So on the 28th of September, we've got CBA, we've got BHP, we've got Woodside. I think we're then on the 27th, we've got ASX, we've got Woolworth, Telstra. Huge amount of income comes at the back end of this month. Traditionally, that income typically rolls into investments. Um, so you're seeing a lot of reinvestment in that, which will keep supporting the market. My view is it's, again, very much data dependent. don't want to sound like an RBA governor, but at the moment, everything is very much dependent on how this inflation number looks. Um, we've got the CPI numbers coming out this week. I think if inflation looks like it's getting under control, take the, my view, take oil out of it, because a lot of them pull that out of the, the headline and not use that in the core numbers anyway. And it's, I think if, if you can look at that, if that looks like it's coming down, my view, yes, interest rates might stay higher for longer. However, it's that outlook where if we think we've hit the worst of it, so the last six to 12 months hopefully was the worst of the cycle where we're not going to get 13 more rate rises, which we're, we're not going to get, hopefully. Um, and from there, if, it, if we stay flat, looking forward, I think it's the companies which are the ones are earning money, making money, looking for growth. So you put all that back into the index and the index is very much controlled in Australia, as Martin alluded to, is the big miners. So the view is on China. If China continues to chug forward, um, they're able to continue just to move their economy along. That's going to bode very well for our big miners being BHP, Rio and Fortescue, which will put a lot of pressure on the market upside. That's about 20, 25%. The banks, I think, take CBA out of it, but ANZ, Westpac and NAB, especially ANZ, Westpac, I see they can't get a lot worse. So my view is that's going to add more back into the market. They've got a big dividend cycle coming up towards the back end of the year. They'll put all their results out in October, November, which will then give you know a feeling for the underlying economy. My gut feel is we'll be up probably 7,400 by the, the end of the year. Um, that's not really too wild and extreme. If you look at the market, we've been 7,400 down to 700, I think about eight times in the last 12 months, but I think we'll be back up towards the top end of that. Um, that's hopefully, you know, boating into the back end of the year where we'll get a Christmas rally, which is an old analogy, which we haven't seen for a few years, but hopefully we'll get one of them again. And then looking forward to another nine months on top of that, back to or six months from the end of the year into 30 June. Again, it, a lot of it, it comes down to the rates and the cycles around the world. Like if the US does move rates higher, um, they're expecting one more, but if that rhetoric changes and they're thinking two more, you know, that, that, you'd say almost all bets would be off. It would be very hard to predict where the market's going. But my general sense, I've always been an optimist, as you know, Jenny, um, but my view would be the market would be, I reckon it'll grind higher. I think it's the underlying economy, as Martin alluded to in the back end of his presentation, is that employment number. The fact that our employment number is so strong uh, and it is strong around the world is such a positive for the underlying economy. So the concerns to the banks in the reason Westpac and ANZ, in my view, are trading so cheaply is there's such a big concern around property prices in Australia. We've had this, the chat about the mortgage cliff, um, where all the fixed rate loans are coming off. They're going from two and a half, three percent all the way up to five or six percent now. That they keep alluding to is saying the cliff's here, the cliff's here, and they keep pushing that down the road. As, and people, what's been happening is because they're all fully employed, they're keeping that money in. They're not going out and spending the money. So you'll see sectors like consumer discretionaries, which will start struggling because people will not be spending the money on the on the wants as much anymore. They'll be saving that money, putting that against the home loans. And meeting with the banks at the moment, like they haven't really increased their bad and doubtful debts or the risk provisions substantially because people are covering their loans. Um, and that's, I think, if they can continue to do that, the employment number stays strong even with all this immigration going along, my view, yeah, the market will be higher by um, 30 June. There's a lot of ifs in there, 
But I think my view would be, yeah, you'd be 74 plus. You could even get to 76 or 7,800. Um, and that's the thing. If you, but with the well-balanced portfolio, even if it does stay at 7,400 for the next six months, doesn't go anywhere from the end of the year. If you've got a good portfolio of good companies that are making income, you're still going to be better off um, than just sitting in cash and doing nothing. Yeah, so so your your predictions are um are that the dividends will um will, other than sort of BHP and the super dividends that they've paid over the last twelve months, yep. um, are you are you predicting that that most companies' dividend payments will remain relatively similar? Yeah, pretty much. Or the, or the big the big dividend payers in Australia are the banks and the the miners. They're the big ones, and they are, at the moment, I don't see any reason the banks are going to substantially change. Yeah. If we see a big, keeping in mind the unemployment, if we see a big move in unemployment you know, the banks will then be under more pressure. If they do have to raise and provide more, you'll see their income coming under because they'll hold some back. Um, they do have payout ratios, which they say they'll pay out, mm -hmm. um, which they'll put in the report saying we'll pay out between 50 and 70% in dividends. It may drop back towards the 50%. Like the BHPs, I think, came in at around 50%. I think the banks might even be higher than 70%, but they can pull that back. Um, and then again, when times are tough, as we saw during COVID, you know, the banks cut, ANZ, Westpac didn't pay dip. Um, and that's something where they can always not pay. And that's where I don't think we'll get to that. Like COVID was a pretty unprecedented time. I think we're, we're certainly past that. Um, and then I think CBA, because they're on a different cycle at that time, they paid their div. But I think I don't see a real structural change to dividends. I think in something like the consumer discretionary space, some of those dividend paying stocks, I think, will come under pressure because that's just a factor of earnings. Um, where well, that, was, um, that was the next question I was going to ask you. Is there any specific industries that we should be avoiding with our investments? Yeah, it's one like I wouldn't necessarily always avoid it, but we keep an eye on it. Like healthcare is one I think I put in my last quarterly saying, look, it was no need to be there at the time because they'll, you know, CSL was in the 300s, um, ResMed was still in the mid 30s, Cochlear was, um, had all that takeover talk on it. That was trading, not Cochlear, sorry, um, Ramsey. Um, that had some takeover on it. And then obviously that all fell through and they've all come off a bit. In the next quarterly, which will be out at the back end of this month or early October, it's the healthcare as a sector that I'm looking at now. It was one we didn't like because we thought it was overvalued, didn't see a lot in it. It's changed completely. Discretionary is now certainly a sector that we're, you know, watching. Um, you know, some of the stocks, JB Hi-Fi is a fantastic company, very, very well run. Um, but my view is it's just purely the fact of the consumer at the moment. And, you know, it's just the difference between needs and wants. And it's like I have that conversation with my kids every day saying, guys, you don't need to go out and buy that. Just because you've earned some money, you don't need to spend it. Um, but it's something where I think that is going to play a lot through in the next six to 12 months in the market. However, again, the flip side of that, if we're seeing them come off and, the, and we're looking at the market and looking at certain names, they will have a point where they have value. Um, and we always have low ball price targets and we look at them over the history. And if it's stock, you know, reaches around that target, we certainly would like to not, you know, throw the kitchen sink at them, but certainly start looking at them. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like a good plan. So uh, a question for you, Crystal Ball. Um, what does your Crystal Ball say about the impact of the, the negative publicity on, content, on Qantas and its share price for the future? Yeah, Qantas is not, I've never actually been a big buyer of Qantas. Um, it's. I find airlines very, very hard to trade uh, and invest in because there's so many unknown risks that um, can destroy an airline overnight. Um, Qantas has been a, you know, Alan, he's done a fantastic job with Qantas. Like when he came on on the board, it was on its knees um, and he's turned it around. The problem at the moment with all the negative news on Qantas, you've got the government involvement, the blocking of Qatar, um, you've got Joyce's farewell payments, things like that. So there's a lot of negative press around Qantas. You know, the farewell payment, a lot of money, that's up to the shareholders and the board not to approve that. You know, now they're the calling for um, the chairman to step down as well. A lot of that's noise. Um, the new CEO has come along. She seems to be doing the right thing. She's making the right announcements. Um, again, my view with Qantas being an airline, it, it comes down to that consumer. Yes, there was a lot of pent up demand for travel post COVID because people couldn't leave the country for two to three years. There's certain people who just travel, who love to travel, and that is buying everything. Um, your business class tickets, I remember at Christmas time, like they were $18,000 return to go to Europe or go anywhere in the world. And I can't believe there were people paying that, but they were, they were selling them out faster than economy tickets. Um, so Qantas was certainly almost peak earnings when it hit that $7 price. Now it's trading around 530 or 540. 
the market's pretty split. You've got some brokers saying it's a buy with an $8 price target. You've got others saying it's a sell um, with a $5 price target. My view, I prefer to put money elsewhere. I find there's just too many risks with Qantas at the moment. The fuel price, a massive concern for Qantas. Um, that, you know, I think they were talking about that yesterday where it went up. They're talking the increase about $200, $200 million a year in excess costs on just fuel. Um, a good airline, but... Yeah, it's very patriotic buying Qantas shares, but I just think, yeah, it's better money elsewhere than in Qantas at the moment. Yeah, I, th- I think you've got some sound comments there for sure. So so while, we, uh, while we've got, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of our clients that, that run self-managed super funds um, and I'm having a lot of conversations with people at the minute as to whether they continue to invest in shares or whether they uh, put a bit more money into into high interest. And I, I think that sort of feeds into um, to Martin's comments about diversification in the super funds. Um, so I would um, I would be suggesting that that um, that you might be getting some calls from some of our clients, Andrew, about um, a little bit more di- diversification. And I certainly um, found it quite interesting your your comments on your um, your Nasdaq 100, your your NDQ um, yep. recommendation. Yeah. So um, so there might be some people that, that contact you about that as well. So other than um, other than the the Nasdaq um, 100 stock that you mentioned, so the other over, the other um, overseas sectors, the healthcare and consumer discretionary, how do you suggest that our super funds get into those sectors? Well, we've got a couple of different products. Um, we've the ETFs, exchange traded funds, are available, um, and we can look at each sector. You can break them down by sectors. You can break them by down by geographical locations. Um, so we can certainly look at that. Healthcare, there is certainly a big health. There's one called Drug, which is the big global drug companies. There is a health one. There's multiple ETFs, which I can go through and look at and find out the best ones, the ones that we like. We also run a couple of other in-house um, global um, providers. Like One is the T. Ray Price. Another one is Aberdeen, which they then manage the money. Um, they focus purely offshore. Um, so they can be good bolt-ons. It's something I, I can discuss with you later as well, Jenny. Some of these, these are run by like a, a managed account product right. where they own the underlying security, but they're a bolt-on, um, which I know the, your views on managed accounts. So that's something we can certainly <laughs> discuss on those ones. But it's um, there are other ways of providing it as well, where we either provide it to an offshore manager like a T. Rowe Price and things like that. The only thing we've got to be wary of, there are obviously associated fees with that. Mm-hmm. Um or the other option is we can look at the ETFs, which are listed here, um, where they'll, again, just add straight to the portfolio. You can see the actual stock codes on the portfolio, You can, and everything's there, the dividends. Some will pay divs, not all of them. Like the global health companies, I wouldn't expect much income from all. Um, the NASDAQ one does pay a little bit every now and then, um, but we certainly can look at that. Similar with ones in the, the lithium space, I didn't allude to that today, but there are global lithium ones. We do also have domestic lithium companies, some that are starting to pay dividends as well. And that's a space similar for tech where it's such a big focus, especially during COVID where everyone kind of just sat back and said, oh, hey, we've got to move green. Huge push for lithium, electric vehicles, lithium batteries and things like that. So that's another whole thematic and sector we can play. Um, similar with the oil and gas sector, which I didn't really allude to in this one because it. Some people don't like fossil fuels, other people do, but that is a, that sector has been structurally short on investment for a period of time. And I think that, again, short to medium term will do very, very well. Um, but yeah, we can certainly look at all that. And again, individually, everyone's different on their portfolios and they may have, as with a number of your clients, they may have other, other investments as well. A lot of them are own their own businesses via the self-managed super fund. And we can just structure it and see what the percentages are. Um, and then on the income side, there's certainly a lot of things we do as well. There's certainly high ownership of um of commercial properties and residential properties in, in a lot of our super funds. But um, yeah. um but the conversations that I always have with clients are the, the best performing funds have diversification, they have a mixture of different investments. Yeah. And certainly um certainly shares pay a big part in that because of the franking credits and the tax benefit of that in the super funds. Yeah. So, yeah, we 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 definitely I think diversification is is our word for today. And um certainly as we continue to have um some um unusual um um measures in in our um, economic outlet um our outlook rather um i think um diversification certainly helps us overcome those all right so i will throw one final question at you today if i may um yep. last one last one for everybody today your favorite stock pick right now what would you be buying 
Wow. Resmed. <laughs> Resmed. Yeah, well, as Martin was just saying, then Resmed is Martin's favourite right now. Uh, he presented yesterday in the morning meeting on that one, and it's it is a very interesting story. It's a fantastic business, and it has come back a long way. And you know, trading around twenty one dollars that is certainly a pick. Um, Martin, Martin's on Resmed. Okay, got it. Yeah, I know. Now he's really put the pressure on me. Wow, I hadn't thought about that one. Um, I've got so many stocks I like, and so many I don't. Um, what would we look at? I think. Yeah, that is tough. You've got me on the spot. <laughs> I think if we're looking... What are the big planes that are Westpac, right? Yeah, I was thinking the bank would be Westpac, would be my... Looking at big end where you're getting an income, I think Westpac at one time's book value, it's historically very, very cheap. Um, and I think it's just the banking sector will do... As long as this employment number stays where it is and doesn't blow out, mm. I think the, the market will re-rate higher. It's just... It had the big change post the Royal Commission. It got hit for six on the Austrac scandal. The CEO's gone. The chairman's gone. It's all new people on board. Re the, it takes time for them to win, you know, market confidence back. And I think once that gets, that's you'll see that move higher very rapidly and catch up to the other banks. Because if you look at a chart, the last 10 years, Westpac has not been a great investment on a capital point of view, um, which is, you know, I think it was 10 years ago, it was probably close to $40. Um, you know, now it's trading around 20, so it hasn't been a great investment. Yeah. You add the dividends along the way, yeah, okay, you haven't, probably haven't lost any money, but it's just, I think there's a lot of upside available in Westpac. Yeah, well, I think I think they're they're two good, very different options as well. The 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 ResMed and the Westpac. Just um, just one one final question from Joel has just come through. Are there any small caps that you would recommend to buy? Yeah, I was talking to Martin before the start of this presentation, and the the small cap sector is quite funny. Martin only focuses on the ASX 100, which is very lucky. I tend to focus mainly on the ASX 100, squeeze out the 200 every now and then. Um, Yes, I think I know which Joel's talking on the phone here as well. Um, but it's, I think the small cap sector, it's its very hard at the moment. It's its all coming down to quality of earnings. You know, if you're not making money at the moment, we're seeing a lot of stocks in that sector, you know, just being sold very, very heavily. I think the short interest in that space is very large and people just don't want to be there because they don't have that earnings. Some of that sector, I think, will come to market and raise money as well, I think. At the moment, there's not really any small caps that come front and centre to mind. Like we've got some, you know, great companies in that small sector, like SRG, which is a very good engineering company, which is something which we like. Um, or Venti, it wouldn't be small cap. So that's a stock that we like very well. That came out of Simic, but that would be that wouldn't be a small cap sector. Um, what else in the small cap space? Yeah, not something I've really looked at closely at the moment because it's it is certainly on the nose. Um, it's a space I think you've got to look at the individual stock within that sector and then work out what that sector is doing as a whole as well. Um, but, yeah, it's not something I've been focusing heavily on at the moment because it's a, that is very very much a hard place to play, especially yes. when things are tough. Like the big end of town is doing it tough. The small end does it, does it even harder. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Yeah. I think that sounds very sensible. So, um, so I would say um, thank you very much to um to Martin for for your presentation this morning, and thank you Andrew very much for your insights as well. We're certainly very fortunate to to have your expertise broadcast to um to our audience. Um, and thank you also to um to our audience for joining Sullivan during on our webinar this morning. Um, I think it's been a very enjoyable and very informative um session. We will um, we'll get a copy of the slides and this webinar record, recording out to everybody. And if there are any further questions at all, um, or if you need any assistance, um, don't hesitate to reach out to Andrew or also to Sullivan Dewing. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.